Um, so this is What's Home a Basket Full of Kittens, and the, which is a little bit of a silly title that I wouldn't normally. Say it again. A Basket Full of Kittens. What's Home a Basket Full of Kittens, which isn't a, a title that, kind of title that I would normally use for my work, but the Greg, Greg and I are friends already. He, he was living in the Benchlands, so um, he's an artist and um, sort of a, a community leader. Um, and at, towards the end of our interview, he started, we got on the subject of a basket full of kittens, and he's so animated about it. It was like, I mean, he gets excited anyway, but he was really excited. And so that was something new that I learned about him was that he just really loves a basket full of kittens. So that just, you know, that stays with, stayed with me. And then in my interview with Fred, one of the things that, one of the sort of humanizing moments in our conversation was that um, one of his memories of, of home and feeling safe and protected was, um, you know, going to his mother for comfort after you know, falling down or something and, you know, a white fuzzy sweater. And so that tactile, I'm a tactile person anyway, and often use fibers in my work or just for fun. Um, so that tactile connection that they both stated, like super, super soft, comforting, squishy things. Um, so that felt like the, the one really obvious unifying thread to me that I could work with because they're really different people um, and their lives are so different. Um, their politics are really different um, in a lot of ways. Andrew's thinking about that. He's like, well, maybe not. They're both but community activists. Yeah, in their, in their own way. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, all three of us are in our own ways. Right. Um, and so in the middle of the project, um, the Benchlands was cleared, which is where Greg lives. And, and so for Greg, that was incredibly destabilizing. And you can see in the larger video, it's not in the little video, but in the larger one, a few quick shots of his home with, his, with artwork. It's basically just an installation of his own in the Benchlands. And I'm not sure, but I would assume that that just went in the garbage. You know, these big paintings and sculptures that he had made. You know, so as an artist living outside, people don't have a place to store their materials or, or their work once it's finished. Um, so that's something that I personally feel really sad about and I would like to work to change in my projects, but that's a side note. Um, so, you know, that was just a really difficult period for Greg and we couldn't get, um, we couldn't really, we couldn't do our third interview, which is, which is a shame and a disappointment to me, but it also says something, I think, about, about the situation, right? Fred became mayor and very busy and Greg was out of touch and so we, we didn't have the third conversation and I started to teach them how to crochet you can see that in the video, but it takes a few times. There's, I think there's very few people who will like pick up a crochet hook and a ball of yarn and just like be able to go with it. So it would have been really nice if we had been able to have some workshops together and more conversations and, and even some community sessions um, to, to make things together. So what you see is just me, <laughs> right? You don't get as much of the collaborative, um, element as in some of the other work where you really see the like hands-on stuff that that the participants made um, but I did so there's maybe more of me in here and my politics like the you know my perspective that housing is human a human right and that I think that harm reduction policies are better than like the war on drugs for just for example yeah, like I'm unashamed, unabashedly political in what I've included in here but um, you know it was a good opportunity to have a conversation and, and I appreciated being part of the project. And, and it, it does, you know, it continues to help me practice being open and maybe not being so um, 
firm in my own positions and to be open to people that I, that I disagree with. And, and it maybe even in this case was literally about to campaign against Fred politically, <laughs> which was kind of a funny, that was Greg's idea, by the way. So, um, Gretchen, yeah. Greg? Well, Greg is, has been up in the armory. I haven't actually talked to him. Yeah, but, um, we haven't, I haven't been able to reach him for the last couple of weeks, so I never know. I hope he's doing okay. He would love to I know. I know, I miss him, yeah, and yeah. I worry well, about him. The armory is a <laughs> it's hard to actually reform the, the dynamics with the armory, which is unfortunate. Um, it's a safe place to be, and it's highly sort of secure. You can't just visit somebody. Oh. It's not set up like anywhere else. And that's a, it's a real draw. It's a real drawback. Mm -hmm. it's, a real, yeah. it's a real problem in my mind. Yeah. It's hard. There, there's, there is a safety that's very important for people. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's much more nuanced. I want to make sure that's on end. It's, mm -hmm. It saves people's lives, including Greg. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he really, really was in bad shape, and, and he, he was very grateful to finally be at the armory, even though that's where he wouldn't have chosen to go yeah. initially. Um, and so hopefully he's doing all right. Well, yeah. Do you have a telephone you can call? I've called over there, and yeah. it's, 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 it's a little more tricky than I'd like it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really hard to keep the social connections. Yeah. You know, over the last few years, I've been really changed by making connections with people who live outside. And it's hard to keep those connections. Um, you know, I become friends with somebody or, or feel, I don't know, I want to protect them, <laughs> you know? And, and how, like, there's a few people in particular that I, that I feel sort of, I don't know, some sort of chemical or familial sort of connection with. And, you know, I lose track of them. They can't get one of the free phones because they don't have the documents or they don't get their stuff together to go to the library and do the thing. You know, there's all sorts of reasons, but unless I happen to find them because they've moved somewhere new or because they're allowed to stay somewhere where I know they are, it's just, you know, a year could go by without me, me seeing somebody and, you know, and, then, and it's funny that now I see them and they'll be like, I was so worried about you. <laughs> so so it, goes, it goes both ways. <laughs> so does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Well, those are emergency blankets. So, you know, I, I with other people, um, buy survival gear and help distribute it. And so, you know, sometimes I'll buy off of evil Amazon, like a case of emergency blankets or hand warmers or things like that. And so I just, maybe I shouldn't have said evil Amazon, but you know what I mean. I use it. I don't like it, but I use it. Um, so just playing around with surfaces, actually, it, my original idea was to make a smaller tent and project directly onto the crochet. And then I thought, I don't want to be crawling inside a little tent in a gallery. I want it to be accessible for me with my physical limitations. I actually want it to be accessible to, to anybody, um, physically, at least. Uh, you know, so I wanted to make like a sensory environment. Um, and the emergency blankets, I don't know. Also, I didn't want to crochet but to, I couldn't have physically made by myself all that. <laughs> as much as I love to do it. So it was a little bit of just like trial and error and like using things that are in my house already or, and the emergency blankets honestly are perfect because they're, you know, people use those to survive outside. And I was working on this during the winter when we had basically an atmospheric river every week for months. Um, and then the happy accident that it's both translucent and reflective is just like, some unforeseen magic that um, I'm really happy that happened because that's one of my favorite things visually about the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm mention one more thing about your work. Okay. Um, it's really one thing that Joy does that you do is, is you rescue um, people, but then there's objects and you have a, an, an Afghan there that probably had many different lives. Oh, the quilt frag. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, um, yeah. I yeah. will just say, I'm not rescuing anybody, because no, people, pe people, <laughs> not to not to chastise you, but I think it's important. Like, um, 
Like, I'm nobody's savior. Right. We're all saving each other, you know, housed and unhoused mm -hmm. alike, and it's, it's very much all mixed up, right? But those, those fragments are, are, I'd had those sort of in my studio storage for about a year. They're actually from um, Highway 1 and 9 when I was for a little over a year going and doing cleanup work with people who lived there. And, um, you know, a campsite would come down in the rain and get moldy and just a pile of mess. Or there were some, five, there were like, I don't know, four or five tent fires. Um, that winter just along that stretch and no, nobody would the fire department would come and put them out But nobody would clean it up afterwards. So me and a group of volunteers cleaned up a bunch of sites like that um, to allow people who were living there relief from that mess and also Hopefully to relieve the community of some of that pressure of seeing and trying to blame individuals for messes that have like the environment gets weaponized against people who live outside just constantly um, so and I normally don't save things um, but th those fragments were just so beautiful and poignant yeah. um, and they also resonated well with this installation mm -hmm. yeah so are you speaking about what's on the outside no if you go in the back there there's oh, two hanging up there's okay. A quilt fragment, which is actually grandmother's garden, is that pattern, and it's one of my favorite quilt patterns. Um, and there's also some photographs of um, Amberly's garden from when the benchlands was being cleared, um, and she got out as many of the plants as she could. Um, and her home was taken, you know, just destroyed by the bulldozer. So there's that's in the not in the video, but some pictures of that. So I think it's true gardens are super important for people um, as well. Yeah. So I'm in convention about your, your piece and your work. Are these all quilt patches? Or these are crocheted. I mean, technically, they're like granny squares. And you, that you are, did them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. Granny squares. Yeah. Yeah, this is like the most simple granny square you can make. Oh. There's tons of really complicated ones. Yeah. 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 And when did you start putting them together? Like, you crochet? I think um, the first ones I probably made, and I sort of started slowly, maybe October, November, but I really worked on it most in earnest, like, um, you know, late December through um, I finished it not long before the installation went up. So <laughs> for several months. Yeah, yeah. Wow, outstanding. That's great. <laughs> it was a lot of city council meetings and a lot of Star Trek Voyager, <laughs> which is all about getting home. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And feel. <laughs>